Hello, book club lovers. We are here again Wednesday night at 7 p.m. with another fabulous African female author for you. Um, and as is our custom, we like to start every show with a quote from an African author that captures or encompasses the feeling of that author's book uh, that we will be uh, discussing. So tonight, in honor of our guest, the quote is by Chinua Achebe, and he says this, when suffering knocks at your door and you say there is no seat for him, he tells you not to worry because he has brought his own stool. And in a little while, you'll understand why I chose that quote um, to talk about um, the piece we will be talking about today. And without further ado, um, I would like to introduce you all to uh, the fabulous Zambian acclaimed author, Mubanga Kalimamukwento, and she is joining us all the way from the States uh, today. So it's afternoon for her, whilst for the rest of us in Africa, it's um, uh, evening. How are you, Mbanga? How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you. How are you, Selena? I'm good. We're so honored to have you um, with us and to discuss your book and your body of work. Um, so for those of us who are watching, please let us know where you're watching from, if you've read um, any other Zambian authors um, and what you're looking forward to tonight in the comment box and we'll um, be chatting to you throughout tonight's show. Now, let me tell you a little bit about our author. Mwanga um, is a multi-award winning artist. Her first novel, which we'll be discussing tonight, The Morning Bird, um, published by Jakana Media, won the 2019 Danane Debut Fiction Award, making her the first and only Zambian to win the prize since its inception in 2004. She won the Kalimba Short Story Prize in 2019 and the Tell Your Own Story Award Zambia 2020. Her short stories have appeared on shortlists for the Bristol Short Story Prize, Nobro Short Story Prize, and Dreamers Creative Writing. Her work has appeared on Netflix and in literary journal journals, including Duke, Overland, Killen's Review of Arts and Letters, The Red Rock Review, Asterix and The Mentor, and her poems and short stories have been translated and published in Italian by Minalik. She has an LLB from Cavendish University, Zambia, and an LLM from the University of Minnesota. Obanga practiced law in Zambia until 2019. She is now an MFA candidate at Hamlin University, where she received the 2020 Writer of Color Merit Scholarship and the 2021 Deborah Keenan Poetry Award. Obanga is an alumni of the Hubert H. Humphrey, Full, Full, Humphrey Fulbright Fellowship, I beg your pardon, and the Young African Leaders Initiative, known as YALI, for her research into prisoners' rights. When she isn't writing, she's working as a fiction e editor for Duk and assistant fiction editor for the Waterstone Review. She's a current Jacobson Scholar and recipient of the Hawkinson Scholarship Fund for Peace and Justice 2021. So this is our accomplished author. I'm, I apologize, Mwanga, if I've uh, butchered some of the names of those awards and prizes. Um, um, but I think that's the point um, uh, of all of the good work that you're doing. Um, and um, tonight we will also be talking about the book, The Morning um, Bird. So in your own words, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into writing um, and particularly the journey to publishing The Morning Bird. Okay, well, I, I don't know what else to add to my introduction. Uh, bios always feel a bit strange when someone else reads them out loud, even though um, as writers, you have to submit them every time you submit a piece of work. But um, yeah, I'm a Zambian storyteller. Um, I love to tell stories in various forms. I'd like to think that my career trajectory has always been me taking advantage of storytelling in whatever uh, form it presents itself to me. Um, so even when I was practicing law, when I was working as a prosecutor and also when I was practicing uh, civil law, it, it's, it's a form of storytelling that involves the lawyer helping the client narrate um, their version of events um, to the court because um, the justice system is not very easily accessible to laymen, you know. Um, so then I, I'd like to think that my transition into novel writing and poetry and short stories uh, is just a different form of storytelling that I've taken. As far as writing goes, um, I've always been writing, 
the earliest that I remember sitting down and trying to tell a story is probably around 11. Um, before I published anything, I used to hear writers say, when, when they're speaking about their first books, they'll say, this is just the first book that was published. Um, you know, and there were others before. And I used to think, what could, you know, what could it be? But now that I think back, yeah, this was just the first book that I was, that, that was published. Um, I felt like I wrote my first book when I was about 13 and my friends and I uh, entered it into a contest and it didn't place. So that kind of tells you <laughs> what kind of, or like the quality of the story, but I never stopped. Um, and then this book, uh, was published, I'd say, two years after I first started writing it. Um, and, you know, publication, you, you've spoken to several different writers on your book club. It's a, it's a rocky journey, right? You, you start out very optimistic. And I know I started out very optimistic and um hoping that the first person that i sent it to would just fall in love with it as much as i i loved it but i probably submitted it prematurely and i had to do many revisions before i finally got a yes um i like to tell this story but i, I had a spreadsheet of all the different places where i submitted my work and by the time it won this award i had submitted it to uh, over a hundred different places um, and it, you know the spreadsheet was marked like if someone said maybe it was yellow and if you know if it was like a yes at the beginning it was green, but of course it was covered with a lot of red for the nose. And then yeah, two years later someone said yes and it quickly made its way into paper and here we are. Well, I mean um, that's very encouraging I think for budding writers um, to keep. Um, going at it and not to lose their drive. And mm -hmm. I think what um, is also useful is um, just the insight that um, you you weren't just sending the same piece of work, you revised it, um, you were able to critically appraise what you were doing um, mm -hmm. to get it to where um, it is today. And for those of you who um, are watching and haven't had a chance to read, um, Mbanga's book, you can get a copy um, for those of us that um, uh, are maybe not um, uh, in ex uh, near an exclusive books or a bookstore like that um, on Amazon so that you can get a Kindle copy at a very reasonable price um, today on Amazon. And you can also get a paperback a print on demand copy if you would like the hard copy uh, version, which a lot of uh, people like to have. So you can get that book today straight away if you haven't read it on Amazon. If you're in places like South Africa um, or other places where exclusive books is near um, to you, you can also get that um, the, the book available there. Um, we've got some people who've joined us and I just want to acknowledge them before we go a little bit uh, deeper into the book discussion. Um, Mulan Mulikita Hall. Hello, Mubanga. So that's for you there for tuning in from Facebook. We're happy to see you, Milan. Louise Miambo watching from Lusaka. We're happy to see you, Louise. Entertainer Tom, good evening on Facebook. Good evening to you too. And Norman, hello from Zim. And you're watching from YouTube. So um, we've got a special audience hotting up as we start um, this discussion. So thank you for joining us. If you've got questions for Mubanga or um, questions about the book, The Morning Bird, please let us know and we will answer them here uh, during the live discussion. Um, so um, you write often, you write for reviews, you write for journals, you also write for competitions, plus you're also saving the world. What drives <laughs> you and how do you manage all of that at the same time? Plus you're also a mother of two boys. How do you do all of that? I have a good support system. Uh, Milan and Louise are my longtime friends, so I was happy to see them um, online. Louise and I lived uh, almost next door to each other since I was, uh, I think, 10. So I have a really great support system. Um, my husband is in the house with the two boys right now so that I can do this. Um, writing, I always write. I don't necessarily write for 
you know, write with the goal of like, I want this to go in this journal, I want this to go here, but I'm just always writing. And then when the process is complete, then I consider where I think it would be well placed and go through the um, submission process. I don't know about saving the world. Um, <laughs> I think my kids might have some things to say. <laughs> about that but I think managing it all is just because I have um, a very strong support system people who support my goals uh, regardless of where I am in the process of achieving them um, so it's not a, a one woman show well well that's um, that's good news to hear um, and very encouraging but we're still inspired and we're still in awe um, uh, because it takes some kind of strength to also um, be able to connect and attract a support system like that um, in the times that we're living in. So without further ado, let's dig into The Morning Bird. Um, and uh, just for those of us who haven't read it, I'm just going to give you a brief uh, uh, summary from the blurb. So when 11-year-old Chimuka and her young brother Ali find themselves orphaned in the 1990s, it's clear that their seemingly ordinary Zambian family is brimming with secrets. From HIV AIDS to infidelity to suicide, faced with the difficult choice of living with their abusive extended family or slithering into the dark underbelly of Lusaka's streets, Chimuka and Ali escape and become street kids. Against the backdrop of a failed military coup, election riots, and a declining economy, Chimuka and Ali are raised by drugs, crime, and police brutality. And as a teenager, Chimuka is caught between prostitution and the remnants of the fragile stability from before her parents' death. The Morning Bird, Bird is not just Chimuka's story. It's a national portrait of Zambia in an era of strife. With lively and unflinching prose, Kali Mamunquento paints a country's burden, shame and silence that when juxtaposed with Chimuka's triumph, forms um, an incredible story. So this book um, that you wrote, uh, uh, probably from about 2016, 2017 to 2019, is actually based in the 90s, in Zambian 90s. Why were you um, reflecting on that period in Zambian's history um, to come about with this book at that particular time? Um, I found that very, very interesting because um, a lot of the uh, historical and social political context of that time comes through very strongly um, in the book. Um, which I'm yet to finish, but definitely in the in the process of going through. What was, what was, why was that topical for you at the time of writing? For one thing, I was raised uh, mostly in Lusaka in the 1990s. So the places that I write about, um, a lot of the smells and sights that I describe are things that are easily accessible to me from memory. Um, but also, I feel like, um, as, you know, when you talk about that, the social political context and it being uh, recognizable, um, my feeling was that it doesn't, appear as vividly when you read um, history textbooks from from that time. Um, it's all very sanitized. And I felt I, I had the feeling of my memory of growing up in that time, being a child in the 1990s, is not uh, often reflected in the work that I could find available. So I was interested in telling a story like that. Um, but similar to the protagonists also, um, I lost my parents at around the same ages. So when I was 10 and 11, my parents died. Um, like many children in the 1990s lost their parents. Um, and many of those deaths were as a result of um, HIV related complications and AIDS and the fact that there was no access to antiretroviral treatment in the early mid and even late 90s right my recollection is that they became available in the early 2000s um, but that's an aspect of the 90s history that's oftentimes glossed over and I was interested in telling like a personal story um, especially from the point of view of a child um, just because I, I feel when it comes to like grief and loss children are not uh, treated with the same humaneness that adults are in terms of how they're processing their grief and having honest discussions with them about what led to the, the situation, right? So what led to the loss of the people that they are grieving. Um, so those are some of the things that I was thinking about. Um, and I was also thinking about so my, my the, 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 the memory that I always go back to when I'm thinking about this story was how there was a period in my life when 
um, when we would be walking back from school to home with my friends, you would uh, find like funeral tents pitched up in the street, um, you know, t symbolizing that someone had died um, from that home. And after a while, it became clear to most of us that at any given day, you could find that tent at your own home. Um, but we were just young enough that no one would have that conversation with you. So if it happened, it just happened and you kind of just had to proceed with life as usual. And also, you know, yes, my parents died during that time and, and that has its own scars that I carry, but I would like to think that I was fortunate enough to still have been surrounded by family and friends. And here I am to tell the story, right? So in writing the book, I didn't want to tell my story. I was considering more um, the children who were in similar circumstances to mine, but weren't as fortunate in their outcomes um, and how quickly that can just change, you know? Um, especially if you're looking at it from the point of view of like, oh, we're walking home together every day. Tomorrow it's this person, the next day it's this person, and then your paths just split from there, you know? So very, very, um, very, very profound there. Um, and uh, we've got Chipo Mayrodandawa um, also tuning in via Facebook. She says, I am proud of you, Mubanga. So we have a really strong... Um, uh, crowd here tonight um, and that's what we love on the book club and then we've got uh, Irene Mataja Chiesu I'm sorry Irene if I just butchered your name please forgive me um, but your comment is I agree with you on the part about how children are never given the same audience when they have lost a loved one so I think one of the as the way this comes clearly actually is in the, the first two chapters of the book um, when uh, Chimuka's father dies. So that's the first death she encounters mm -hmm. um, and how she goes to the school, how she goes to school like normal, but there is a haunting sense. You can feel it as the reader in what you reveal to us about um, how she's sent to school. Um, you know, you're aware that something bad is coming. So we've got the owl, the, forebo the foreboding mournful sound of the owl and you know her father's words ringing in um, her ears and you know um, that follows and that haunting atmosphere follows her to school and um, there's almost a sense like everything is being kept normal but um, obviously we learn later that cultural processes are underway for the telling or not telling of what has happened in this huge um, life-changing moment in her life and then what I find very interesting is um, um, because I, I, I wondered why, um, you know, you, you, you highlighted that. And I think one of the themes, obviously, is the issue of family secrets, which is something that we, we see throughout the book. But I think it's also just to paint a picture of how normal and how typical her childhood was before this event. Um, yeah. And then um, how from there, it's almost like the unraveling of a sweater, like everything mm -hmm. gets taken away. And one by one, she's um, losing people. And then, you know, from there, like, it's like the violations just keep getting um, um, uh, uh, unraveled or not unraveled, but just there's a layer of violating that just keeps just getting closer and closer to the core of who she is. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I just, there was an element of violence that was escalating throughout um, the book. So very, very interesting to me um, that you did that. And um, I thought very, very effective because I think that is what the feeling or the experience of grief or sudden grief, but mm -hmm. I would rather say sudden loss um, happens. And I think um, sometimes the grace we expect to get when um, somebody gets a chronic illness like um, um, AIDS um, is that is the time to prepare. But for these children, there is no time to prepare. And it's almost a picture or a microcosm of a larger generation of children who carry Absolutely. that trauma in adult years. Yeah. So that yeah. was very, very um, interesting to me. And what I also found interesting to me is when doing the research about why you wrote this book and, um, um, you know, the, the reflecting on your personal experience of loss and how it was so different. The aftermath of it was so different. Your outcomes were different. 
to mm-hmm. Shimoka, I was like, well, lady, this is a commitment. Like now I'm unpacking it from how it was for other people. And a lot of, I think the, the, you know, what we see from reviewers and especially African people who read the book, who were a certain age at that time, is Mm -hmm. there's a relatability and a reminiscing and a connection that's there because, you know, there's also some, this, this resonance that says, okay, well, well, these kids that we see on the road, where do they come from? Is that a tumor? Yeah. So very, very powerfully done. Thank you. Well, I really like what you said about the fact that her life had a sense of normal before first loss. Uh, For me, it was very important to tell the story um, from before the first loss so that she wasn't being perceived only through her grief, that she could also be perceived for everything else that she was before. Um, because of the last thing that you said of when you see, we still have thousands of homeless children in, in Lusaka um, and around the subcontinent, I know. Um, perceiving those children, not just as what you see them in that moment. And they might not be children, right? They might be teenagers, they might have grown up there, they might be adults, they might have children there, but that they have a story prior to getting there. Right, mm-hmm. um, that really was very, very important to me. Um, and I had one agent that I submitted to that suggested that I should delete uh, the first six chapters of the book, uh, oh. which means that her story would have started only the day that her father dies, and that's all. Mm-hmm. all about her and so some of even some of the decisions that um she makes later on wouldn't have had context you wouldn't understand mm. what, she, what she aspires for because all she is to the person who's reading is you know whatever whatever situation you find her in um so mm. i felt a responsibility to tell a story that included um her life before that um as well and um you know, I, I wrote it and it was published in, when it was published, I wasn't in Zambia. But then when it, when it after it was published, I, I was I was back in Zambia and I was thinking about, oh, sometimes I would encounter um, children in some of the streets that are in my, um, in my book. And then I would actually, I have to pause for myself and, and, and think about what perceptions I carried with me before and whether I also learned something through the process of writing the book and telling that story. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we've got Molenga Chimba. She's just joined us. Justine Lusapi, please join the con- conversation. So she's calling someone else. Well, we're happy to have you, Molenga, with us and um, joining us. And please drop a comment um, on your thoughts on the conversation that we're having um, right now, not only about the book, but the social issues um, about um, uh, child homelessness. Um, and, um, you know, there's so much in the book in terms of Chimuka's stories, in terms of social issues. Issues that are prevalent around our rights around mourning, um, our um, uh, cultures and cultural mores around um, uh, bereavement, um, uh, and um, issues around inheritance laws, even um, because that's one of the, the you know the, the first violations and those types of things. So very very um, interesting. So we've got Chienda Joe White saying joining us from Facebook, having lost a parent at eleven, something that at that age you never thought would happen to you until that tent is mounted at your house. Yeah, very very insightful and very deep. And I think there's an also an element to which um, you know when you were talking about you would walk home um, from school in those days and you would just see like the tents would just spring up um and you would see that oh, okay so this is what has happened um is that i think sometimes we forget that we almost even have a little bit of um compassion fatigue because during that period of time early 90s going into late 90s probably early um um 2000s um you know there was a lot of this happening due to some of the issues you talked about access to um, the right kind of treatments and also um, um, just knowledge about adhering to the right kinds of treatments. So there was a lot of loss. And I think over time, uh, what happened is it's a little bit like what we're facing now in the world yeah. where there's a little bit of compassion fatigue. So people become numb. And then you don't realize that actually for a lot of um, young people that were 11, 10, 13, um, you know, certain ages that this 
was deeply traumatic. And even for us in our um, older years, or adult years, when we lose a parent, it's still traumatic. So imagine what it's like, um, you know, at that age. So I think um, it's very, very interesting because I found that the impact, the book has a lot of reviews. Um, it's got a lot of, a lot of people who are deeply impacted by it, um, that um, you were actually speaking to a generation that, as you said earlier, whose stories were not told. And when we talk about that period of time, and we talk about big things like the attempted coup, we talk about the politics of the time, um, we talk about issues around poverty and justice, um, we're not, there's a whole um, aspect to the lived realities that we don't get. So that's something that always excites me about African female authors who write about um, actual periods of time and history um, in their fiction, because I'm like, you, you're giving us a piece of that back. Now, um, looking at your protagonist, Chimuka, and looking at the people around her, there's some very interesting um, family members. Um, and, you know, her immediate family is, is quite tragic. That's quite intense. But just turning to some of the people that um, create a strong thread throughout the book. So people like Ali, her brother, and people like uh, her aunt, Bo Satali, like those people to me are very interesting um, characters. So with Ali, you get the feeling almost like this guy never had a chance. There's almost a feeling like when he is 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 getting involved in, in certain antisocial behaviors, you, you're just like, as much as you feel for Chimuka, but th this guy, you're like, this guy just didn't have a chance. Like, he just couldn't get out. Um, and then you look at people like um, her aunt and the very stark contrast from when her father was alive and afterwards. Like this, it's like, who is this person? Um, and we don't often talk about that um, culturally, um, these dynamics in our families and how um, the people that are supposed to be home, are supposed to be safe, uh, can sometimes be other people completely, um, um, completely different. So, Speaking particularly about both Tali and the family she brings and the impact that they have on Chimuka, who, what, what, um, how did you draw um, that picture and paint that picture? Because Bo is also interesting, even from the skin lightening issues. Um, you know, I mean, very interesting um, character because not there's no one who's ever completely bad in life. So it's like, you were just like, okay, we're just going to say, tell it for what it is. Like what those two characters in particular, they, to me, they're a little bit like impact characters. They drive um, the events along, but they also put Chimuka in a situation where she has to make certain choices. What, what, what was, what was going on there? Keeping in mind that I wrote this, um, how many years ago? Three, four years ago. Uh, I think what I was thinking about was that you can come from the same set of situations and still have different outcomes. So the three of them were essentially being raised by the same set of parents, but they were at different ages, um, you know, different genders sometimes. And, um, you know, all three of them for me were just trying to survive and their survival um, manifests differently um, based on where they are. So even with um, Bostali and when her behavior is um, seems abrupt, right? Um, if you think about it in the context of like, what did she perceive as most important to her? What she perceived as most, most important was staying married to that person. Right. Um, you know, and for Chimuka, what she perceived as most important was having some kind of family structure, what, whoever um, occupied that family structure. Right. So she was always shifting as long as she could feel a sense of community, then she would like exist in that space. And if it didn't work, then she would move to the next space and things like that. Um, so I was trying to be kind to all three of them and the kind of choices that the story was telling me that they should make. And yes, no one should ever be perceived based on their one bad choice, which is why I, did, which is why I go back to the thing of, I didn't want to tell Chimuka's story starting from um, right after her parents died. I wanted to give like a holistic, um, narration of her existence and what brings her to the end of the story. Mm -hmm. 
Awesome. Very, very cool. Um, we've got Alice Mulo Muyambo, and she's got a question for you, Mbanga. Awesome listening to you, Mbanga. I've always been curious, did the title of the book drive the story, or did the story lead to the title of The Morning Bird? And I'm also interested to know your answer to that, because The Morning Bird, it's kind of like... Um, you 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 tell us the story of the morning bird straight away when we get stuck in the book, um, you know, which is quite a brave choice for an author. Um, but do, did you you were like, okay, the morning bird, I'm going to write this book, or did the book tell you at the end of the story that this is what the title of the book should be? The book told me right at the very end when I had finished the story, when I had started submitting it. And I think right before I submitted it to Jakana the second time, actually, because I had submitted it to them a few months before, like an earlier version, and then I submitted for the competition, is when I got the title. So I actually wrote that first line last after I had finished writing the story. And then I started infusing it into different places in the book. And so for me, um, in the end, it wasn't just about the foreboding of the morning bird, but that Chimuka was a representation um, because uh, even as the book progress progresses, she's grieving different things. Um, so I was excited when I saw the cover because the cover was a surprise. Um, because they they have the owl right at the center, but they have her um, also kind of like wrapped around it. So it's almost like she's wearing this uh, cloak of grief. And I felt like that was so accurate, a representation of the story that I was telling. Um, and I, I've, I, you know, I've been in love with the cover since I first saw it. But yes, it came to me at the end and not at the beginning. I didn't know what the book was going to be called when I first started writing it. Um, so uh, we've got Kamana Maselo's mom. Well done, Mubanga. Everything that society never wants to talk about. And I agree with that. And I think it is important um, for society to talk about that. Um, uh, there is an, um, um, an, a part in the book where Chimuka um, is now living with uh, both Tali and um, that family and um, Ali um, is away and, you know, will come back at different times during that time in her stay. And she marks or she has almost like a aha moment where she talks about the difference between um, all the different lives that adults lead. Um, and it's very, very interesting um, because you can tell there's been a journey from when you first meet her um, and, you know, through the loss of innocence and kind of like the eroding or the stripping away um, of hope um, to a certain extent. Um, um, but what I do, I like books that give hope um, to the readers. So I do like the fact that um, um, uh, you give a sense of hope and you plant the seeds of redemption in her story um, to give us hope because I, I don't like books where, um, it, you know, it's all, it's all tra tragedy and, and grief. Um, so I, th I think for me, it makes sense. But, um, you know, you've got some huge themes here, um, loss, um, HIV and AIDS and the stigma of that during that period of time. You've got family secrets, you've got colorism, um, you've got poverty, you've got um, sex work, um, you've got uh, gender inequality um, and transactional sex um, and violence and, the, the you know, women not having a right to their labor. Um, because even if Chimuka is um, ends up uh, being a prostitute, there's an essence in which um, Ali in his own undoing um, starts to perpetrate a kind of violence towards her labor, her time, um, in, you know, how he, in working out his own pain and grief, um, starts to, to act out against her. So, the, I mean, it's a lot. I mean, you can sit in and unpack it for, for ages um, in terms of the some of the, the issues that um, are unpacked and raised there. But um, in terms of the um, impact and what people have read into the book, um, have there been reviews or interest or responses to the book where you were like, oh, I never thought of it that way? Or where you were like, yes, that's exactly what I was going for. Um, how's the impact? Um, how have you read that? How has that affected you and your kind of view of this narrative and the story?
So as far as feedback, okay. So I only get insight into that when I'm in um, conversations such as this one and speaking to people who've read it because I try and avoid reading reviews of it because I know that's a slippery slope. Um, and each time that I have conversations with people who've read the book critically, I do encounter new perspectives that I wasn't thinking about um, because see when i was telling the story i wasn't i didn't have like a checkbox i wasn't thinking oh it's going to include transactional sex and it's going to include how she perceives herself in the world and gender roles and th things like that i wasn't thinking about that i was just thinking about once i created the character and the family that she lived in and the time what could likely happen right um and you know those things come in later and surprising things come in different forms for example i think one of the last conversations that i had about this book um someone asked me why her dad was such a terrible dad and i said look my dad died when i was 11. maybe i don't know what a good dad is <laughs> this like i thought he was a fine dad apparently not you know learn something new every day but yeah, it, it's always interesting to hear how people are absorbing it versus how I was putting it out. And I, what I was hoping for, for sure, is that people would make of it what they wanted or what they could. So I try and leave, I know you were talking about hope and planting seeds of hope, but with me, when I'm telling stories, I try and leave it at a point where it's not concluded yet, where my things could still happen for my character, whether those things are good or those things are bad. And so readers come to the story with their perceptions and their hopes. And that's what, that's how they finish the story for the character and the characters. Um, yeah. That's all I have to say about that, I think. Well, um, well, I mean, kudos to you for not reading the reviews, but I did come across um, two reviews that I thought really did justice to the book, and I'm going to read them out for our readers who haven't read the book and the hope that you will go um, and read this um, book because I think, um, you know, we just don't understand the richness that there is in terms of um, the literature that's out there and what African women are writing. We just, we don't actually realize the, the breadth and the depth of the stuff that's out there. So this is from a reviewer called Afro Bon Vivant. And um, I'm just reading a little, a tiny excerpt from her very long review, um, which was quite um, interesting. And, and uh, I found a very interesting take on the book. Um, she says, this is the age old story of the tumultuous relationship between mother and daughter, the favoritism relationship between mother and son, the twisted around her little finger relationship between father and daughter, the things unspoken relationship between husband and wife, the contempt quietly brewing underneath the surface relationship between a spouse and their in-laws, in the overprotective relationship between brother and sister, the nothing will ever be the same relationship between life and death. This is the story of how one's normal can be ripped from them in a manner of days and their new life a stark contrast from their previous reality. And I thought that that was a very interesting um, uh, take on the book and quite apt. And um, and just this last review I want to share um, as we coming uh, towards the end of this conversation. And this is from another author who's also recently been published. And her book has uh, been republished by Blackbird Books. And this is Natasha Omokodian. And she will actually be with us next week. And this is what she wrote in her review. Um, a good book is one that gives you a new lens to see oneself and to see others through. The, mo the Morning Bird is one such book. Her language use is lyrical and a keen observation of everyday life shines through the pages. For example, two men were pushing a faded green wheelbarrow in it was a shadow of a person, a gaunt, genderless figure, all loose skin and wispy black hair. When the wheelbarrow ran over the rubble, a surprisingly deep voice escaped the shadow. Now, that is something we see where I come from, and I've never seen it recorded before. And I, I, I had to read that out and I had to share that um, sentiment because I think that's the power of the story and why it's so important that Africans write about themselves and why women should add their voices to it. Um, it's something that there are things that we are seeing and that we are experiencing. And 
it, they need to be recorded. Otherwise, the human story will never be complete. Um, we've got Chimuka M. Katambo. Hi, Mubanga. And she's got a heart there for you. Um, and Justine Safi has joined us. Welcome. We've been waiting for you. Um, and she did reply to her friend there um, um, saying time. So um, as we wrap up the conversation, one last question for you. The process of publishing the book as an African female. Was there anything that struck you as particularly nuanced regarding gender, ethnicity, race in terms of the publishing process? Or um, did that not really actually play anything um, into kind of like the, 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 the system or the trade publishing system that you were going, um, that you, you entered in? Because uh, some of the authors that we've had went the self-publishing route because there weren't that many opportunities, but you um, went the trade publishing route, um, which comes with it a lot of benefits, but it doesn't mean that it's any easier. Um, what was that perspective like for you? Well, I was very fortunate with the publisher that ended up picking um, the book. I, I felt like this was the perfect home for it. There were always up to now are very enthusiastic about the work and are supportive. Um, the publishing house is run by a woman and my editor was a woman and she's half Ghanaian, half Zambian. And they picked her specifically for me so that she could understand uh, some of the nuances of the languages and the description. And it was very helpful to have her on my editing team because I think what my personal experience with submitting uh, the book was was I I started to lean towards a tendency to over explain myself um, because I was learning that a lot of in order for my book to get out there there were a lot of people who were reading it who didn't necessarily understand the languages but let me just say that I also didn't necessarily understand all the languages in my book I used um, two languages that I understood and one language that I don't speak or understand at all so I depended on several of my friends to make it as clear as possible. And so I got to a point where I thought, well, if I can get over the fact that I don't hear and understand this language, someone else can too. Um, but my editor was very affirming because um, in particular, there was um, one, one, two spots where I was trying to describe uh, fritters and I, I used the word vitumbua. And I think I had gone over and over again trying to think about how am I going to describe this thing and in her email back when we we're going over that line she said look you've already told these people that this thing is being fried in oil after that if they don't want to know what it is they don't want to know what it is this is such a small part of the story you can't keep like bending yourself this way and that in order to be understood you just have to tell the story and hope that the people who want to understand it will come to it so uh, you know, I had a very good experience with my publisher. It, it was a very contracted amount of time. So the award was announced in November and the book was published in June. So it was many sleepless nights back to back. Also because of the time zone thing, sometimes they would email me and say, we need this back in two days. But by the time I was getting it, they needed it back in a day or like a day and a half. So a lot of hard work, but everyone was working hard on the team. So I felt extremely supported. And in that way, I've been very fortunate um, and my transition from being an unpublished writer to being a published writer has been relatively smooth as far as I can tell from the stories that I hear, yeah. Yeah, well, that's good to know um, because I do think um, you had a great editor and I did notice the um, use of vernacular languages with English um, and it, it really came through quite um, um, understandable and quite relatable still um, and, um, and lended the authenticity to the place, the time, the culture, the people um, by using the tongue. So I thought that that was very um, nicely done because sometimes over explaining can make reading something very cumbersome. We've got Diana Vanity Palibe Kantu. Um, so Diana has been on the book club before and she's from Malawi and she says, hello, this is amazing. Mbanga. So Diana, it's great to, to hear from you um, and um, to know that you're following and that you're enjoying the conversation. Um, so we're coming to the end of our conversation and I feel like we haven't even scratched the surface of um, the book. 
but um, we are aware that some of our um, viewers on the book club get upset with us when we reveal spoilers of books that they haven't read. <laughs> So um, I hope we haven't given away too much. Um, but again, if you would like a copy of The Morning Bird, go on to Amazon, um, uh, do a search under The Morning Bird, and um, you'll search for it with the author's name, Wanga Kalima Mukwento, and it will come right up. And there is a version on Kindle, which is very affordable. There is also a hard copy um, or what we call paperback print on demand version that you can order and have it delivered to you. Um, and for those of you in South Africa and other places where Jakarta Media has reached, you can look through at stores like Exclusive Books. So um, the book is readily available. It's worth a read. Um, and um, we hope you enjoy it. And to whet your appetite, as is our custom, Mubanga is going to read an excerpt from her book to close out today's book club. So Mubanga, take it away. I'm reading from chapter 13, which starts at page 104. Um, they were invisible before. The group of teenagers next to the Adventist church on Independence Avenue, the scantily dressed ones who roamed Cha 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 Road, the ones who lived under the bridge on Greatest Road, the ones along Cairo Road, everywhere. I never saw them until I became one of them. They were not the children on the billboards littered around the city the ones that warned, do not give alms. The children in those billboards stood in a neat single file behind their pregnant mother, waiting on a smooth-faced stranger to put some money into her open arms. They wore bright colored clean clothes, which were torn only over their knees in neat square patches that didn't show too much of their shiny brown skin. Their eyes were bright and alert, devoid of sadness, loss, being lost. The soles of their feet had no cracks. Clean black hair on each tiny head crowned it all. Do not give arms. But the children in those billboards were not the children on the streets of Lusaka. The children on the streets had hardened faces and swift hands, dull eyes and parched lips. They had thick red rashes and thin patches of hair spread apart by big white ringworms. Very stark, very, very stark um, picture. And I think a picture that we'll, we will continue with um, as we go about our business. Um, and we see those faces that we sometimes tune out, <laughs> um, you know, in our day to day. So thank you very much for that very important reminder. And um, one last comment from Chenda Joe White. Actually, the book review now has me wanting the book. Thanks for the sneak peek. Well, we hope that you definitely get that book and take the time to read it. It's an easy read, very well written, um, a very striking story, very interesting um, characters, very relatable experiences, um, and very important conversation for us to be having with ourselves and with each other about the society we want to create as Africans. So thank you very much, Wabanga. And we are so happy that you joined us um, uh, for this conversation. And um, to the rest of you that joined us on Facebook and YouTube, we'll be back here next week, Wednesday at 7 p.m with another fascinating, fabulous African female author um, from us here at the book club tonight. We say good night, stay safe. And um, as the season is changing, whether it's getting colder where you are, or whether it's getting warmer where you are, just remember to stay safe. We wanna see you back here um, talking books uh, because we'll be here to go through 2021 with you. So goodbye and good night. Thanks for having me, Selena. And thanks for everyone who came and left questions and commented i appreciate it yeah much love much love good night